Hello. Hey, how's it going? It is going pretty well, actually. I just yesterday got my new book that I'm going to be reading for our Summer in the Psalms series. It's Psalms by the Day by Alec Moyer, and I am super excited. He is a an Old Testament scholar, and he translates the book of Psalms intentionally being mindful of each psalm's overall structure. So he kind of builds in his own outline of the psalm so that you can watch the flow of thought throughout the psalm and periodically makes notes and whatever, but it's really his translation and uh, structuring of the psalm that I'm super excited to read the psalms through his eyes. So I am Super excited about our upcoming Summer in the Psalms series and super excited that I get to start reading this book soon. And so I'm doing really well. How are you doing? Wow, that sounds awesome. I am so glad you're going to be reading that book. I have not started the book that I'm going to read, which is Psalms as Christian Lament. But I bet I imagine we should pause just in case uh, folks have not listened to last week's episode We are doing a Summer in the Psalms series. We're going to be starting it. Uh, It's going to run from Labor Day to Memorial Day. Nope, that would be in reverse. It's going to run from (laughs) Memorial Day to Labor Day. And we want our whole listening community to join us in that reading plan. We're trying to break it down such that you really only read approximately 25 verses a day you know, give or take, depending on where it naturally broke well. But the idea is that we will all read the Psalms together over the course of the summer and just saturate ourselves in the Psalms. So we hope that our listeners join us in that. And we'll be using our thoughts segment uh, each week to reflect on our reading experience that week. So I can't wait to have that conversation with everybody. So thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, and we're just a couple other things we should mention to everybody is that we'll be, I don't think you said this, posting the reading schedule in the show notes and in our social media stuff so that people can follow along with the reading schedule. And to be honest, a a piece of why I'm reading a little ahead of time is that I'm not awesome at doing the same thing every single day. And so I'm banking some days so that I can... (laughs) stay with the schedule, even though uh, I struggle with consistency in some ways. Oh, man. Yeah, for sure. I'm with you. I don't know that I'm going to be banking days, but I will probably be using some catch up days on occasion. So I know what you mean. Yeah, absolutely. But Uh, thank you for bringing up the show notes. I actually would love to tell our audience that there's a new feature on our podcast that we've not been able to use before. And it is a chapter feature. And so if you want to go back to an episode, because clearly everybody listens straight through the entire episode every single time. <laughs> so if you want to go if you want to go back to a particular segment in an episode, we have broken up our episodes accordingly. So if you want to like, oh, I think Josh from Missouri had an amazing thought in this episode, you can literally click Isn't that all uh, on, the episodes? On that chapter. Oh yeah. I guess that's true. Maybe we should have changed that to me because that's probably only in one episode. (laughs) But but anyway, uh, so it's a, it's a neat feature. It does not retroactive back to some old episodes, but starting at around episode 45 or so, uh, that chapter feature is available. So that's pretty cool. That is a super cool feature. I got to be honest, when I first saw that feature come up on YouTube, I thought it was a really goofy feature and I didn't think it was a big deal. And now on YouTube, I regularly find myself using the chapter feature. Um, Yes. So I'm excited that we can do that with our podcasts. Yeah. Yeah, I am too. Uh, And somebody use it because it takes me time to add it. So uh, anyway. (laughs) Uh, So I'm super excited, though, that you mentioned the Psalms for another reason, because it actually introduces what I called you about today. Hmm. So I want to read kind of a lengthy quote that was read to us during Lent in my spiritual formation class. And it really talks about actually the violence of the cross. And it has a really interesting tie-in to the Psalms. And so even though I want to leave the Psalms for the Summer in the Psalms series, it's a bridge to what I want to talk about today. So let me read you this quote. And I would really love to just talk 
a little bit about why the cross is so violent and what we should do with the, how that makes us uncomfortable and all of that. So let me read this. Mm. This is from Fleming Rutledge, and she writes this. A wise Benedictine monk once said, if you can't handle the violence in the Psalms, you can't come to terms with the violence in yourself. This is even more true of the cross. If we can't look at the cross, then we can't look at ourselves either. When you reflect upon Jesus Christ hanging on the cross of shame, you understand the depth and weight of human sin. How do we measure the size of a fire? By the number of firefighters and engines sent to fight against it. How do we measure, measure the seriousness of a medical condition? By the amount of risk the doctors take in prescribing dangerous antibiotics or surgical procedures. How do we measure the gravity of sin and the incomparable vastness of God's love for us by looking at the magnitude of what God has done for us in Jesus, who became like a common criminal for our sake and in our place? Wow. Yeah, it's a little bit long, but it's so worth quoting. She just writes so beautifully. But I'm, I'm so what is that from? It's from uh, her book, The Undoing of Death. And it was also reproduced in an anthology called Bread and Wine, Readings for Lent and Easter. And it was from that anthology that our professor read that. Uh, I just thought mm. it was really, really good. And I, in fact, I had to write her an email and say, where was this from? I have to have this. This is so good. So Yeah, that's a really powerful quote. So I I'm curious, from that quote, you have mentioned offline that quote three, four, five different times to me in anticipation of having this conversation today. I'm curious what particularly strikes you about that quote. What is it that you want to talk about from it? Yeah, I think as we look forward to our Summer in the Psalms series, I recognize that the Psalms are often violent and the psalmists often celebrate God's violence or ask for God to carry out vengeance on their behalf in a violent way. And this makes us really, really uncomfortable in the 21st century. That's mm. not a, a picture of who we, got, we think God is going to be. But even more than that, she says here, if you can't handle the violence in the psalms, you can't come to terms with the violence in yourself. And then she carries that forward to the cross and says, if you can't come to terms with the violence of the cross, then you can't come to terms with the violence in yourself. So with the cross, I mean, I'm tempted to look away from the violence or read past the violence. And she's telling me that that might be in some way connected to my inability to recognize the violence in myself. And that, to me, mm. makes me pause. And that's a good point. I want to make a distinction, though. In my upbringing, one of the things that often happened at Easter was that all sorts of implements like hammers and nails and whips and things would be trotted out to really make sure that I grasped the gruesomeness of the cross. And it seems like the gorier, the video version of the crucifixion, the more authentic so that we could really feel how bad it was that Jesus had to go through all of this. And that's a complicated approach to celebrating Easter. And I think that there's something different between what you're saying you want, you're kind of inviting us into today and that. Am I right? Yes and no, because I think it depends on the heart with which it's done. Based on this quote, I feel like I'm supposed to focus for a time on the blood and the gore and the violence, and I'm supposed to connect that in some way with the effect of my own sinfulness and the effect of my own way of living and the violence that it causes. Mm. 
And so I don't want to look away. I don't want to minimize it. In fact, I do want to bring out some of those opportunities to reinforce what is so easily to look away from. So I do want to do that, but I don't want to do it for its own sake. And I think that's where the the heart comes in. And I can't speak to the heart with which it was done in the context that you referenced, but to do that for its own sake, I feel is just pointless. Uh, but for the sake of understanding the gravity of sin and the magnitude of what Christ accomplished, that I think is important. Does that make sense? It does. It does. I- I'm really caught by this phrase you used a moment ago, the violence of my own, the violence in my own soul. The violence my sin has caused, I think, are two different things you said. What does that mean to you? I think that's what I'm trying to figure out. I think that's what this quote is forcing me to to stare at long enough to be able to answer. And that's kind of why I don't want to look away from the violence. I almost want to talk about the violence. I almost want to talk about the blood that was shed and the very fact that this is gory and uncomfortable and doesn't set well, I don't know if it's going to lead to my ability to answer that question, but I feel like this quote is pushing me toward that end in hopes that it will. Yeah, that makes sense. As I think about it, I find myself asking myself, what does it say about the character and nature of God And sometimes we say that phrase and and just kind of throw it out there, but I really mean those as distinct things. What does it say about God's character? What does it say about what it means to be God, his nature, that God led the world towards the crucifixion? What does it tell me about who he is, that this was his approach? Yeah, yeah. Part of what drives this conversation for me is a a conversation I had with a guy a couple months ago, and I walked away from that conversation ultimately feeling like, oh, I'm not sure if you're a Christian. I know you use those that language, but I'm not. And I don't walk away from those conversations like that very often. Um, So I want to be respectful, but like I I just trying to illustrate the, the shock that I felt. But anyway, in that conversation. He spoke about how his frustration that certain pastors want to talk about the cross so much, that they talk about this this very violent act. And why talk about that? Why focus on that? Because why wouldn't we just talk about the wonderful teachings of Jesus and how it shapes the world and how it how the teachings of Jesus affect our modern day moment? And so we pull a little bit out of the New York Times and the USA Today and a little bit out of the Gospels, and we we show how Jesus' wise and wonderful teaching benefits us all. Why wouldn't we focus there? And I think that speaks somewhat to your question. Wait a minute. I think the cross has something to say about who God is. We might miss some of his character and his teaching, we might miss almost all of it if we ignore the cross, even though it's violent and uncomfortable. Yeah, that's interesting. So often, I feel like Jesus' life gets split in half. There's the focus on his teachings, or there's the focus on his crucifixion, and and which one's the most important, right? Right. And I I think, you know, the interesting point that you're making, some somewhere near half of each gospel is the lead up to the cross. It is clearly in the minds of the authors and presumably in God's mind as he inspired those authors. It is the story. Mm. You know, I, I remember watching, I can't remember what movie it was, but it was some action movie it might have been a, one of the Marvel movies. The final battle of the movie is like half the 
length of the entire movie. And I remember thinking as we got into the final battle scene, oh, the movie's almost over. Okay. And then it kept going and going and going because the battle was the climax of the story. And so there was more and more focus put on it because it was the centerpiece of the story. And in the Gospels, it's very similar. This is the, the moment that gets the most focus because it is clearly significant. Yeah, right? The first half of every Gospel covers about three years, and the last half of the synoptics cover, you know, three seven days. days. Yeah, three days. And it's amazing how much time slows down to really focus on this event. But I like what you said about two halves, right? That we often split the the gospel story, Jesus story into two parts, almost like he's two separate people that we have this wise, benevolent teacher doing these amazing miracles and bringing life wherever he goes. And we have this violent death on a cross that he willingly submits himself to. And I don't think we do ourselves any favors by decoupling one from the other, which may be one criticism of the Passion of the Christ movie. Um, It only focuses on this moment. And as much as I don't want to look away from the violence, um, somebody once said this about that movie, and I thought to myself, that is really true. The question was, how much blood does the human body actually have? And it just seemed like <laughs> he just, that movie portrayed so many buckets full of blood everywhere that you're like, uh, I think he ran out. Uh, so I don't want to overdo it. And nor do I want to decouple it from the rest of the gospel story. But to your point, the fact that it spends half of the gospel narrative focusing on this moment says it's really, really important. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, and so I'm going to draw from Mark because in the last four, five, six years, one of my favorite moments in Bible study was the moment that I realized Mark had a structure. Have I talked about this on the podcast before? I don't think so. Okay, so fairly simply put, and and, and I just, I don't know if this is going to be exciting to anybody other than me. If you're one of my friends and you're listening to this, you have heard me talk about this before, but Mark's a 16 chapter gospel and Mark chapter one, verse one says something to the effect of, this is the good news about Jesus, the Christ, the son of God. That's Mark's opening summary statement. He's trying to show us that Jesus is the Christ and the son of God. And the, this is going to get where we're going, by the way, I have a point. All right. and I have faith in you. It, all right. Uh, and then at the halfway point of the book, right at the end of chapter 8, Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ. And then at the end of chapter 15, so at the end of the story, without the, without the epilogue, which in, in Mark, the, the resurrection really is the epilogue, uh, at the end of chapter 15 the Gentile soldier looks at Jesus on the cross and says, wow, this really is the son of God. And so the story is bookended by the two moments where Mark sort of says in effect, okay, I told you I was going to tell you what it means for Jesus to be these two things. Now I've showed you one of them. And now I've showed you the other one. And the second half of that for Jesus to be son of God, it starts with Jesus first prediction in Mark, I think it's his first prediction in Mark, of his crucifixion. And then it ends with his crucifixion. So this whole bit, Mark is trying to say something about Jesus' identity that is entirely focused on this idea of being the Son of God and the idea of crucifixion. Mm. I think that's interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. And it's not just Mark, right? I mean, Jesus himself focuses on his own death as his way of commemorating uh, and remembering him, right? This is this is what we do in communion every single week and it starts with Jesus. Jesus 
I mean, says something really gross. I mean, if we're just being frank, while they were eating this, I'm going to read from Matthew because I, I've been spending a lot of time in Matthew and you're bringing in Mark, which is great. So, you know, poor Luke, he'll come along Sunday. But anyway, um, Matthew uh, 26, uh, starting in 26, while they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his, his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood. And this is what we do every every time our faith community takes communion, to remember Jesus. But as I look at Scripture, right, it's not just, you know, the Gospels that make a big deal of this uh, blood sacrifice, and it's not just this idea of communion that we've carried forward for thousands of years. It also goes back in time to ancient Israel. And I'm taking this class on ancient Israel and their religious practices. And a lot of it centers around blood. And I think we all know about the bloody sacrifices, right? And we talk about Jesus being the Lamb of God, but the significance of blood in itself as this very source of life. You know, the command in Leviticus 17, you must not eat the blood of any creature because the life, the life, the nephesh, the, the, the source of life of every creature is its blood. Anyone who eats it must be cut off. And later, you know, in Genesis, or earlier even in Genesis, where it talks about the blessing of Noah, he also said you can't eat the meat with the blood in it because that's the very life source of that animal. And uh, so there's there's a focus on blood and sacrifice and death that goes really, really far back. And I feel like I don't know what the net result of putting all these things together will be, but I feel like it all kind of fits together. And I'm kind of left with all these puzzle pieces going, huh, this matters somehow. And and somehow it helps me understand myself better, but I don't know what to do with all these pieces yet. Yeah, that makes total sense to me. I, I was going to say, even before you made that final comment there, that I feel like on one level, the Sunday school, Jesus died for my sins because I'm a sinner and he's the savior. And I come up against that and think, yes, I get that. That's so like a piece of me is like, yes, I understand. And then another piece of me is like, but I feel like there's something deeper here. Yeah. Uh, Which is, I think one of the things we both love to do is to ask, because really the question we're asking here is not what does it mean to think about this, but what does it mean to think deeply about this, right? Yeah. And it's always fascinating to me that it is often the things we have thought the most about on a surface level that are often the hardest to think about on a deep level. Yes. And I think that's where I find myself. I'm recognizing, especially through this quote that I read at the beginning of the podcast, thinking deeply on this matters. And by doing so, I stand to learn a lot about my own self and the violence that is in myself. Yeah. I mean, every time you you, you use that phrase, the violence that's within myself, the thing that I find myself thinking about is how seldom I think of my sin as an offense against God. Right? Like, I know it hurts others. I know it hurts myself. I am generally aware that it offends God, like bothers him some. Maybe it's not the sort of thing that can be in his presence. I I guess I come to the suggestion in my own mind of, does sin do violence against God? And if so, what does that mean? And I think some of this comes out in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, here I am coming back to Matthew, right? But in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you've heard it said, don't commit murder, right? And this goes all the way back to the blessing of Noah that we just talked about. 
and and is repeated Mm -hmm. multiple times throughout the Old Testament. Don't murder because that you're spilling the lifeblood of somebody else, the life source of somebody else. And that person was made in God's image. That's not okay. And so, you know, Jesus reiterates that. He says, you've heard it said, don't commit murder. But I say to you, whoever, you know, basically responds angry to your brother has committed murder in his heart. And now all of a sudden, I'm guilty of shedding blood through my own sin. Jesus has made this connection for us, but I don't know that I've wrapped my head around it. Well, and it's interesting, you know, love God, love your neighbor. All of what you just said, I end up putting in the love your neighbor box. And on no level do I think about, is this a sin against God? I just think of it as a, yeah, it's somehow I'm sinning against my neighbor in that moment. So that's one thing that I find my I just find interesting about my own thinking. The other thing is I'm really struck by this life and blood connection. You know, we're talking in very negative terms. Violence is inherently theoretically it is inherently a negative concept. But this biblical claim that life is in the blood and that it is therefore somehow sacred? Is that a fair word to use there? I think so, yeah. So much so that, like, the Old Testament forbids, you know, medium-rare steak. Right. My training is to say, oh, that was just God wrapping up a health code in religious language because the people didn't know any better. I'm not saying that's the correct interpretation, but that's my training and my default. And somehow I wonder if that's lazy. Yeah, I, I'm i with you. I'm struck by that as well. And I appreciate what you're saying about the positive and negative aspects of this, right? Violence is the negative aspect. But could it be that when Jesus said, here, drink this cup, it is my blood, is he in effect saying this is my life, my life given to you, not just for you, but given to you? Is yeah. is in is some way is God imparting His own life to us? Well, if we were a different tradition, we would certainly believe that. Right. I meant that as a joke. Um, right. This is a great question. I, I think on what level is. Jesus drawing not just the negative violence line through the whole Old Testament to the cross, but you're right, this positive line of, I've taught you and taught you and taught you. Life comes from blood, and now my blood is accessible to you. And therefore, say it with me now, (laughs) right? Um, Yeah, right, exactly. Which I think is a wonderful point, and I don't want to discredit it, but I feel like it's another moment where we might be tempted to rush to the benefits, the positive side of this, rather than allowing ourselves to face the magnitude of the violence and the evil and the atrocity of it all. Um, You know, we were talking in our class, particularly about the sacrificial system in ancient Israel and how it illuminates what Jesus accomplished on the cross. And one of my classmates said something that I thought was really profound. They said, we often talk in the church about forgiveness, but we don't often talk or we don't talk as much about atonement. And Mm. that's what I think the, the violence of the cross teaches us that my sin didn't just need to be forgiven. A price needed to be paid for it. It needed to be atoned for. It needed to be made right. And it is an inherently violent, bloody, costly endeavor to pay for that sin. Yeah. Well, and that all fits really well into the belief that, you know, what is the context of our our beliefs about the cross? Atonement inherently makes more sense if we are uh, 
seeing the world as a world at war and seeing ourselves as inherently rebels rather than just people who ignored a no trespassing sign. <laughs> yes, right? I uh Andy Stanley has a great saying about this that we need to recognize ourselves as sinners not mistakers. We didn't commit some mistakes. We sinned. And that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. Well, and even, you know, as you say that, I'm reminded that there's a large chunk of the law in Leviticus distinguishing between these two categories. Am I remembering that right? Like, you do the this particular set of things for an intentional sin, and this particular mm. set of things for an accident. Right. Yes, you're exactly right. And I'll be honest, the traditional sacrifices that we think of as atoning for sin, most of my sins do not actually get atoned by those sacrifices because most of my sins are not accidents. The last time I accidentally gored a neighbor's bull because I didn't know I was going to do it, just not a thing that happens. Right? Like, I, it, the 728th time I snap at somebody because I'm being a jerk, not an accident. The, yeah. the hundred and hundred thousandth most judgmental thought I've had in the last month, not an accident. It's a habit. If that's the scale and I'm being honest, yeah, then all of a sudden, I am forced to acknowledge myself into the rebel camp, not the mistaker camp. Right. And then you're confronted with the cross and the penalty. I don't know. I, I instinctively want to not use any word that has historically been used because I think we're, we're tired of it. We don't see it. We don't experience it anymore. I don't want to say the penalty because that the penalty that was paid, like we've heard that too well, many if we, times. If we look at this from a victim's perspective, you know, one of the things I've, I've had to do pastorally is sit with people who have been sinned against in explicit and really violent ways. And the only way, that they can come to terms with God being a good and loving God is for justice to ultimately be served in their case. And the only way for the victim to deal with the transgressor becoming a Christian is to acknowledge the cost paid when the transgressor becomes a Christian is a greater cost, not a lesser cost. Mm. That starts to work in certain circumstances. Right. I, I'm so glad you brought this up because in my job at 911, we get exposed to the horrible effects of some people's choices. I was just talking with a call taker the other day who is processing through the fact that they listened to somebody, what they thought at the time was get murdered. That person is in the hospital. I, I don't know their prognosis as to whether or not they're going to recover, but that person listened to a violent act happen and thought that he had listened to them die. Mm. And you think to yourself, I want justice. I want the person who did that to pay for the reckless, horrific thing that they did. And you just, your whole body screams for justice. Mm. And in that case, you almost look at the violence of the cross and go, wow, I guess it was necessary to save that guy's sin. But was it really that necessary to save my little petty sins? <laughs> yeah. And now I'm right back where I started, right? Yeah. Except at least for me, the nonsense 
of my own thoughts in that regard are brought to light. Sure, sure. For me, when I think that exact same set of thoughts, I find myself thinking, oh, okay. So at the end of the day, I really do just think this is a matter of scale. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. Right. Yeah, well said. I don't think this is a categorical issue. I should, but I don't. It's like I'm teaching my son to drive right now. And if the speed limit is 45, I have taught him it's perfectly okay to drive 50. In certain circumstances, stop listening, wife. Uh, It is perfectly okay to drive 55, but you probably should not be driving more than that. It's just a matter (laughs) of scale. Right. Right. And we think our offense or our rebellion or our whatever is on a scale. We don't think it is a categorical problem. We don't think it is an issue of our nature that needs to be changed. And I think perhaps that's maybe that's a piece of this. The lifeblood of God was needed because my nature was screwed up. Yeah. It took something almost magical to take the blood of God to restore the nature of my being that was so fundamentally flawed. It could not fix itself. Yeah, you're exactly right. And as is often the case, I realize that as we come to the end of this segment, nothing is resolved here, right? We're still just left kind of holding this bag going, huh? That's a lot. And so Mm. the only way I can think to even wrap this back up is to end where we started. And with all of this in mind, reread Fleming Rutledge's amazing quote. And so if you don't mind, I'm just going to read the first part of it, the one that we've really been discussing here. Yes, please. A wise Benedictine monk once said, if you can't handle the violence in the Psalms, you can't come to terms with the violence in yourself. This is even more true of the cross. If we can't look at the cross, then we can't look at ourselves either. Oh man, I am, even if all we did was take some time to at least do it, I feel like we have taken the time to look at the cross together in this moment. I agree. And I hope, at least for my own reading's sake, set the stage for one way that I can process the violence that we're going to experience in the Psalms. As we look ahead to to reading this and feeling uncomfortable at times with some of the violence, maybe just take some time to live with that and to stare it in the face for a bit, I think is going to be super, super helpful So once again, I want to turn to the audience and say, I hope you join us on this journey through the Psalms. Like Josh from Missouri said earlier, you can download the reading plan from our show notes or on Facebook. We're going to be putting that up every single week. And we hope to go through this journey together and saturate ourselves in the Psalms, the positive Psalms, the violent Psalms. Uh, just the range of human emotions that we experience. We want to do that together. So come join the conversation on social media. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. I look forward to other people's thoughts on this. It's a uh, fascinating and, and complicated, but super important conversation topic that I would imagine we'll spend our whole lives really wrestling with and coming to understand more deeply. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So if we can, I uh, we've kind of had a heavy mood, but if we can uh, mm-hmm. shift gears, I'd love to ask you, Josh from Missouri, what else you've been thinking about? Man, I'm not sure I'm going to lighten the mood here, so I'm, I'm glad I'm going first. Hopefully you can transition us into a lighter mood uh, with your thought. But, uh, you know, I've been reading Philip Yancey's Where the Light Fell, his memoir. Have you read this yet? No. So it's quite good. He's an excellent writer. And uh, one of the things I'm struck by, the short version of his story is that his mom and dad felt called to the mission field. 
Uh, when he was a child, his dad died, so his mom never ended up going to the mission field. And she had a clear sense that God promised her that Philip Yancey and his brother would take the place on the mission field that she and her husband that passed away did not ever get to fulfill. Mm. And so they grew up with the weight of this sense of religious duty, imposed calling, whatever you want to call that, on them, much to both of their detriment. And Mm. I know a pastor who will often say, you know, we all know no evangelism is bad evangelism. And then he'll wink really big. <laughs> because clearly there is bad evangelism. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm struck by the fact that I think we need to be careful and acknowledge that in the exact same way, no Christian parenting is bad parenting. Wink, wink. Hmm. Sometimes... Not having dealt with your own emotional junk and then sprinkling Jesus on it and using that as the foundation from which you parent results in lots of unhealth. Sure. I, I And I don't mean to say that about anybody in particular. I just, like I said, I just had started reading this book and I love Yancey's writing And I'm just struck by how heavy it is for him to have lived his whole life in the shadow of this expectation. So how's that for a light thought? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I mean, it's a good one. And I think to some extent, it speaks to every single one of us parents. Absolutely. I, I can think of some of the growth journey that I've been on. And I've thought to myself, man, I wish I had figured this part out before I imposed it or it found its way into my parenting. Geez, I think I would have done a better job as a parent if I had only known this or grown in this area. So to some extent, we're always going to be parenting out of ill health. Mm -hmm. I think what you're saying is let's not pretend otherwise and let's really do the hard work necessary to minimize that. Yeah, that's ex- thank you. Thank you for wrapping that up because that is exactly what I'm thinking to myself is an essential part of good parenting is having the courage to admit my own brokenness and weakness, to surround myself with people wiser than myself who can speak into that, and to give myself the space to heal because if I don't choose to take the time to heal, ultimately I will inflict matching wounds upon my kids. Mm. Yeah. But let's go back to the way you said it because it sounded nicer. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Uh, we can do that. <laughs> but uh, what about you? What have you been thinking about other than uh, the violence of the cross? Yeah. Well, okay. Okay. I feel like this podcast episode is me just introducing topics that don't resolve. Uh, So this is another (laughs) thought that is yet to resolve. Um, You mentioned way back when, when we did our episode on the grand narrative of scripture, and you spoke about Abraham and how God had spoken to Abraham and called Abraham, but he didn't know what to call him. So he just called him the high God. And What you didn't say in that moment is that the Hebrew word that gets used there is El, and El makes its way into Scripture all over the place. Even the city name of Bethel is Bait, house of El. And so we have lots of El Shaddai, El Elyon, all of these terms that we appropriate to Yahweh, to God that have this L derivative. And what I'm fascinated by in my Israelite history and religions class is what the textual evidence and what the archaeological evidence indicates about 
what L worship was like and the questions that surround it. You know, was, was the worship of L a prototype of the worship for Yahweh? Once they knew Yahweh's name, then they just like, oh, okay, that's, you know, he's not L, he's Yahweh. Okay, got it. Or was the worship of L somehow different from the worship of Yahweh? And was there some level of syncretism that came out of this? And we see all throughout the Old Testament that Israel was prone to worshiping other gods, including Baal and Asherah and all of these other gods. So it's entirely possible that El was some sort of syncretistic worship that happened and got confused with Yahweh. And the archaeological record is is only suggestive. It's it's very vague. And the biblical record doesn't make it very clear either. So it's just really fascinating to be reading these different scholars and their opinions about what this looked like and and at what point, you know, Israelite religion kind of shifted or morphed or whatever, or if it did. And so anyway, I guess my my head is just in that world, trying to make sense of really scant, inadequate evidence. And it's fascinating. No, I, I think this is really interesting. You know, the I remember the first time I read the book of Genesis, in which my takeaway was, wow, the religious world was messier than I thought. Yeah. Muddier than I thought. And I, I think that's what you're hitting on is the fact that, man, it's muddier than we want to give it credit for sometimes. Right. Well, and there's an archaeological find that refers to Yahweh and his Asherah. And people have assumed based on this that at least some in Israel at some time believed that Yahweh and Asherah were a, a couple, that, that Asherah was his consort. And so there's other kind of icons that kind of show Asherah, but then like a blank space where like a god would be expected to be, but it's blank. And with the fact that they couldn't create an idol of Yahweh and I, you, you were forbidden to create an idol of Yahweh. So could this blank space represent Yahweh along with Asherah? And could this have been something that the Israelites did at some point? Like, it's you're right, it's muddy, and we don't know a lot, but it's not cut and dry and simple like I thought it was. Yeah. You know, and, and if I can steal that segue, there is something that is cut and dry that we do know the answer to, and that is is the witch Josh question for this week. <laughs> How was really that? Was that a good segue? Your, your, yeah, your newscaster skills are, are really getting up there. Yeah, absolutely. But boy, I, I thought I did pretty good there. Frankly, I, I'm going to send myself an award. But, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, but the question for this week is, which Josh hiked Yosemite National Park with his wife? For their 10th anniversary. And the answer is... Is me, Josh from Oregon. Yes, this is one of the great stories that Shelley and I love to tell because there's like a couple of aspects to this. One, I have often taken Shelley hiking and like just... I could hike and hike and hike and hike. And she's like, okay, I can hike for a while. And then like, I'm kind of done. And I always exceed her threshold. And so we did that. And then some on this trip to Yosemite. Uh, but, but it's funny because you got to back up the story a little bit before, before our anniversary came, we had talked, you know, over the years of like, oh, wouldn't it be cool to add a, anniversary band to her wedding ring. And wouldn't that be cool to do on like a major anniversary? And somehow it had come up that maybe on our 10th anniversary, I'd buy her this anniversary band to go around her ring. And I had to break the news to her. Like at some point, I'm sorry, we don't have the money. I was really trying to make this happen, but you know, life happened and it just, I cannot make it happen. And then our financial things shifted again and I was actually able to make it happen. And so I surprised her with it. And so Ooh. when we, 
Yes. So that was awesome. And she was super jazzed about it. So then when we're hiking in Yosemite, and we're actually hiking all the way to the summit of Yosemite Falls, which is a really steep, hot, dusty hike. Um, the whole time, she's like, he bought me a ring. He bought me a ring. He bought me a ring. <laughs> like, it was her little mantra to get her up. Uh, but she did it. Oh, and uh, uh, we made it to the summit. And uh, so it was great. Oh, man. I really thought that was going somewhere else. I thought you were going to tell me you got all the way up there and she like pulled the ring off to look at it again or like dropped it or like it was gone. Oh, I thought that was going someplace dark. That would be really tragic. I don't think I would ever get her out hiking again. So like that would be, (laughs) yeah, that would be horrible. Well, I'm glad that didn't happen then. (laughs) All right. Well, this has been really fun. Thanks for having conversations that don't resolve. Uh, But we do have to end it at some point. So are we on for next week? Absolutely. I can't wait. I'll talk to you then. All right. Talk to you then. Bye. Bye.